the memo had been widely circulated. This <laughs> queue, right? I believe so, oh, yes. I know, but I had the same, so right? <laughs> I typed my Aren't you proud of me? I am. When you talk big phones, you don't have to worry about us. Exactly. Laura, I'm getting nearsighted lately. He said where the program began. Is that your... You are now live. Oh, all right. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thanks to WGA. Uh, are we alive? Are we all set? Perfect. All right. Well, thank you to the Western Governors Association for convening this excellent workshop, including this session on building a resilient long term timber supply. It's an honor to be with you today as the panel's moderator. My name is Laura Schweitzer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Western State Foresters and the Western Forestry Leadership Coalition. Our organization is based in Denver, Colorado. We're comprised of 17 Western states and six Pacific Islands, as well as the less Western leadership of the USDA Forest Service. We focus on serving as the leading voice and trusted source of information and expertise on the most pressing issues facing forests in the Western United States and Pacific Islands. Coming to today's conversation, one of the most pressing issues that we focus on is uh, sustainable forest management and the link to long-term um, health of forests and the communities reliant upon them. Inherent to these discussions is uh, focus on the vitality of forest products markets. Strong markets support the economic well-being of communities and can provide needed resources for forest managers to carry out ongoing forest restoration work. We spend a lot of time in policy dialogues discussing the contribution of federally held lands to timber supply. However, we know there's a profoundly important contribution as well made by non-federal holdings to our nation's timber supply. In the Western US, state and privately owned forests are major producers of forest products. On the stage with me today to talk about a range of issues related to forest management and forest products are some thought leaders from the state and private forest world. First up, we will be hearing from Robert Venables, Executive Director for the Southeast Conference. After that, we will hear from Helge Ng, State Forester for the State of Alaska. Following that, we'll hear from Justy Doucette, Executive Director for the Alaska Land Trust Office. And finally, we'll hear from Tessa Axelson, Executive Director for the Alaska Forest Association. It's a pleasure to be here today. I look forward to the conversation. And with that, I will turn it over to Robert. All right, thanks, Laura. And uh, thanks again to uh, WGA for coming to Alaska and having this workshop here. I love the title of this, and I've just got a few slides that um, we're going to, uh, we almost showed this morning, but we're going to go ahead and go through now to just uh, talk about the, the topic of working lands and working communities. And while this panel is more focused on timber, the environment in which they, they conduct their commerce and their industry efforts is in the broader context of what I'm going to just kind of run through on a few slides here. And, you know, the kind of pictorially, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, what, what else is happening you know, in the in the Tongass here in southeast, you know, the the three pictures there, you know, really uh, give an idea of energy, transportation, um, transmission, and and mining uh, are reflected in those those uh, those folks those those pictures there. But you know, uh, here just kind of give uh, some reference to where we're at. We've got 34 communities, kind of all dispersed throughout uh, the region, and you can see how disconnected we are which is what brought the organization together uh, as, uh, as it exists today since uh, 1958. But uh, obviously a lot of, um, of area to cover, but what's really striking is the fact that in the midst of all of this, uh, the, the land that's available is um, really not available. It is double click. How come I'm missing? Uh, no, well, my slides are out of order. There we go. So, um, 96.5% is owned by public entities, most of it in federal hands of one sort or the other. And these are all the communities that are struggling to, um, to, to thrive in the midst of that and needing access uh, in so many different uh, ways. And just kind of a, a reference point too for you know, what those, um, my 
slides are out of order here for some reason. But anyway, here's just pictorially what the, uh, um, the e economy really represents in our approach towards uh, uh, you know, our mission of strong economies, healthy communities, and uh, quality environment in Southeast. And one of the things, if you didn't already see the spoiler alert on the, on the slide that's somewhere right ahead of there, I was asking at dinner you know, uh, last night to folks, you know, we know aggressive logging happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And um, you know, over the last 100 years, we've heard the headlines, we've seen the, you know, the, the posters. You know, what, you know, I, I asked, so what percentage of the Tongans do you think has really been you know, harvested over the last 100 years? They said 100 years, oh, probably 20%. And you know the the, the reality of uh, you know is just a click away. Maybe there he goes, two point six. You know, and I think you know really the context of that is a, really helps change the conversation about exactly where and what's going on and um, what really could and should be made available. Because in that context, um, that kind of kind of gives a sigh of relief that. You know, the 17.6 million acres, uh, you know, really are uh, available for our multi-use opportunities for working communities. But one of the things that, um, you know, again, just looking at federal lands and what is a multi-use force, um, can you see the black, the, the big black block or there? You can't see the big black block, block can you? You can see it? Well, it's, um, do I get a pointer on this thing? Well, anyway, if you see straight down, you know, this is a little tiny black. That that that's your 2.6, uh, you know, percent of the forest that has been uh, utilized and available for the the timber industry, and you'll have folks talking about that um, uh, as going forward. But you know, as we talk about you know policy angles, you know, how do we address the big issues? Um, you know, we were inspired by a couple of WGA states that had done state specific management tools and of course Alaska has been doing uh, roadless for 20 years before there even was roadless national law uh, national rule get to get my wording right correct but um, you know so a few years ago we took a look at you know how can we you know emulate those successes the other states had and there we go and so the state um, you know attempted to go down that way and one of the things that I thought was really instructive uh, throughout this process uh, it was, a, was the, the mechanism that was brought together to, uh, you know, to represent each one of the, uh, the, the main industries that were occurring within federal lands in the region. And a couple of members that were on the, that are actually here with us today as well. But you know, each of these uh, industry representatives were able to bring forward um, good discussions about what it would look like to have something different than an all or nothing um, political solution for that was eventually uh, em embraced. And so, you know, that's the kind of the backdrop that I want to kind of just leave out there before we get into the, the more in depth uh, re, um, re reports and policy discussions is that there are ways forward that really can incorporate. The community input, the tribal input, the industry um, needs that a working force requires, uh, even on federal lands, and especially in Alaska, and especially in Southeast, those things are really Im important and critically so. And one of the things that uh, Southeast Conference does, um, and I made you know, mention to it uh, earlier today, it's a good thing you guys don't have PowerPoints, because uh, I think the batteries are dead in this thing. But um, I have a few of these economic plans up, up front here, and I put the by the numbers report on the table for those of you. Uh, but you know, really, that multi-member uh, uh, approach towards tackling the issues of the day is really what I think will bring forward a solution set. And again, the the committee structure that we do, we spent a year and a half with over 400 uh, regional leaders taking a look at the strengths, looking a look at the opportunities and the challenges that we have in order to move the timber industry along with all the other ones forward in a way that can, um, can lead to some sort of sustainable, predictable, because those are the key words that we heard at earlier panels, and that's what's really been missing here, and you're gonna hear a lot more of that um, throughout the rest of the, the panel. So I just wanted to leave you with questions. 
um, you know, kind of the, the overview of what each of those uh, top sector initiatives are, what some of the challenges are and the priorities. But as we dig into the, the timber ones, uh, we can get to, into that more depth uh, as we get uh, later on in the panel for questions and whatnot. But I kind of want to at least show you on the, on the map and, and graphically um, kind of the context of, of where timber falls into the, uh, the current, not the historical, uh, and hopefully uh, we can improve on that in, in the future. So with that, I will um, yield to our state forester and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Helge, you're up next. So I'm Helge Eng. I'm the um, State Forester for Alaska and uh, the Chief of Division of Forestry on the Department of Natural Resources. So our, um, our main task is really to protect the lives and property of Alaskans from wildfire. Uh, no surprise there. <laughs> we really are the Division of Forestry and Fire Protection and to provide timber for Alaskans, and I'll get back to that a little bit. And lastly, to administer the Forest Resource Practices Act and the rules. So I, I think it's important to emphasize in this forum that working forests where timber harvest occurs regularly uh, is a, an essential part of diversified local economies. Um, and um, I think it's always been like that in Alaska, and it's just uh, recently that things have changed. Southeast Alaska, if, if you don't know, is actually incredibly fertile. Other areas, uh, timberlands, you have to plant trees after harvest. Here they literally jump out of the ground uh, after you harvest an area, and uh, you have to go back in and thin them out because there are too many of them. Southeast Alaska is, is a temperate rainforest, and it's one of those areas that are among the most productive in the world, along with the Olympic rainforest in Washington and the Redwood Belt in California. So uh, the Southeast Alaska really has some of the most productive timber areas in the world, and it would be a, a colossal waste to not make use of this natural resource. The, uh, the elephant in the room here is, of course, the Tongass National Forest and the Forest Service and the uh, decision to stop harvesting old growth, the um, reinstating of the roadless rule, and uh, we won't get into that in any detail, but um, the net result of that has been a drastic immediate fall down in uh, timber supply for the timber industry in the southeast. And uh, to give an example, <coughs> the uh, land base of timber land available for harvest on the Tongass National Forest right now for young growth is somewhere between 270,000 and uh, 400,000 acres, depending on who you ask. In, in either case, clearly that's not very much out of a total of 17.6 million acres. So. Um, the upshot is the state needs to step up and provide the balance of that timber supply in order to um, keep a viable timber industry in the southeast. I if the timber industry should fold and leave, it's very difficult to build back up. So it's critically important for us to, to maintain the existing um, industry in this area. And um, Governor Dunleavy has, in fact, um, concluded exactly the same thing and given us the charge of developing the timber bridge, as it's called, which really is um, exactly that for the state to step up, um, increase their timber harvest, increase their timber supply. And uh, the premise is that um, the Forest Service will come online with their uh, young growth timber in a few years. If not, the timber bridge currently uh, temporary will probably become a permanent fixture and we will probably see a much more active forestry program on state lands going forward. 
I think we will see the latter. I think the timber bridge is here to stay. And um, I think the Forest Service is, um, as, as Robert alluded to this morning, they, they try very hard and uh, they are, like us, re <coughs> constrained by policies from Washington DC, which neither they nor, nor we can uh, easily change. So, um, except for that, I think uh, the whole concept of um, managed working forests is something that's been lost in the last few years. And it's been rebranded towards restoration, towards <clears throat> mitigation and other such um, parameters. And I think it's, it's good for us to remember that not so much in Southeast Alaska, but in, in the West in general, fire, uh, bark beetle epidemics, disease, is, is a major toll on forests in the West. Um, and um, it's, there's really no way of dealing with that. Uh, we have discussed reintroducing natural fire. And um, there's a difference there between desired conditions and achievable conditions. We could have reintroduced natural fire if there were few people living here, but at this point, there's people living out in the wild and urban interface everywhere. And the option of reintroducing natural fire really is not there in, in most cases because people tend to take a really dim view of their house burning down. <laughs> and uh, I certainly do. So we are charged with protecting people that live out among the trees. So what do we do in, in lieu of natural fire? Well, we manage our forest, we thin them. So we take out enough trees that the remaining trees are spaced far apart. And a wildfire, if it breaks out, hopefully skunks along the ground, it doesn't climb up in the crowns of the trees and becomes a catastrophic fire. So um, working managed forest is really a, um, really a godsend for local communities, both ecologically and economically. It's, it's a essential part of a diversified local economy, as I mentioned. It really provides the only tool we have for um, coexisting with natural landscapes in large areas of the West. And um, I think I'll leave it at that and uh, let the others speak. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good, okay. My name is Jesse Doucette and I am the executive director of the Trust Land Office. The Trust Land Office is contracted exclusively with the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority to manage approximately 1 million acres of land statewide and other non-cash assets. The Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority is a unique state corporation that operates similar to a private foundation using its land and invested resources to fund programs and initiatives that help improve the lives and circumstances of Alaskans who experience behavioral conditions and developmental disabilities. Since the inception of the trust 25 years ago, timber from trust lands has generated about $52 million. Recently, we've completed the state's largest land exchange in Alaska with the US Forest Service, which restructured the trust land portfolio in Southeast Alaska with approximately 18,500 18, acres of land more conducive to revenue gener generating development, lands that are valuable for timber harvest. It has created jobs and provided economic opportunities for resource use in remote areas of the state. This allowed nearly 18,000 acres of land that the US Forest Service has received near Southeast communities to be protected for their significant natural, scenic, recreational, and other public values. The trust anticipates 25 to $30 million in revenue over the next 10 years generated from the timber sales by harvesting nearly 110 million board feet. A little about me, I've been working in Alaska and the natural resource industry for the, about the past 14 years. Going back even farther, I grew up in Montana in a very hardworking logging and ranching family. We paid attention to markets and access as our ranch was adjacent to Forest Service land. Cows are trees, that's what put food on our table. 
I recognize the viability and the sustainability of the timber industry. It's important to me and it's important to the trust. Thank you for having me today. Good afternoon, my name is Tessa Axelson. I'm the executive director for the Alaska Forest Association. The good news about going last on a panel like this is your friends and the folks you get to work with regularly say all the things you were planning to say. So I'm gonna on the fly shift a little bit of what my comments were going to be. What I'd like to talk about this afternoon is who AFA is, why that matters to WGA, and how there are opportunities from what we know that is happening in timber in Alaska that can have, we can have conversations about across our western states. So first, who is AFA? The Alaska Forest Association is one of the oldest industry associations in the state. We represent the forest products industry in Alaska. What that mostly means here in southeast Alaska is timber operators, sawmills, and other adjacent industries that are related to timber. What is probably most important to know about the industry is we are active and we're likely not what your idea of timber harvesting is from 25 years ago or even the shows that some of our members have starred in. Um, Robert talked about earlier in his comments that one of the challenges that we face, but also an opportunity, this is a Alaska story, it's also a Western state story. What is real for our communities and our states is often co-opted as part of a national media campaign or part of other stories that are being told. And so what we feel like as the association is so critical to tell people first is, we're really proud to be harvesting timber in Alaska's forest. Um, one of the things I love about the title of today's panel is that it's a resilient timber supply that's predicated on a harvest occurring. What we know about active forest management is it not only serves our community in the form of jobs, resources to our state, municipal entities, tribal entities. Earlier today, I know you all talked about, listen, Alaskans are unique, we love that, we like to talk about it a lot. There are some very interesting and unique ownership models in Alaska. I don't know if you heard it earlier when folks like our colleagues from the mining industry were speaking, but less than 1% of Alaska is held in private ownership. That matters a heck of a lot if you are in the timber industry. And so what that also means for us and what you saw depicted in Robert's slides from Southeast is very little timber that is available in Alaska to our member operators comes from any form of private ownership. And in fact, very little of it overall comes from other landowners like the state, tribal entities, the vast majority in the Tongass, for example, almost 75% of the Tongass is held in federal ownership. So that means that our operators work for the key to the industry, a predictable long-term supply with a very unique group of landowners. And one of the reasons that I think it's important to highlight that is related to a couple of things that other folks have talked about. So both Helge and Justy spoke about the roles that the state is playing, Division of Natural, Department of Natural Resources in providing a bridge timber program. You all probably guessed that we need a bridge because there's a big river that we can't get across. Let's just theoretically consider that that river is the Forest Service's inability to provide the supply to meet what's in the 2016 Tongass Land Management Plan. That inability to deliver isn't unique to Alaska. And I say that because this is also part of a discussion for Western states around what tools, what models exist for us to have industry supported with mechanisms that allow private, nonprofit, federal, municipal, state entities to all come together. And in Alaska, part of what that has looked like is good neighbor authority, which is a really remarkable tool that has been used in a number of Western states where the Forest Service comes alongside other entities like the state of Alaska, for example. It's also an opportunity that we see where entities like the Trust Land Office can work through legislatively directed, because Congress has powers too, and sometimes is really effective at telling federal agencies what to do in a way that makes sense in states. But directing land transfers, we've also had land transfers that have occurred in the state of Alaska that have benefited our tribal entities. Um, see Alaska, for example, received land transfer some years ago that assisted in a number of their pursuits economically and land grouping additionally. But there also are broader tools that I think in the timber industry we think less about, but that we need to be discussing. 
the power of an entity like WGA is that you have Western governors who are joined together by both geography and some of the shared interests of their states. And so broad ranging MOUs can be used to identify particular economic initiatives that WGA has a history of that. Also identifying particular areas that are of concern to, our me to member entities. Workforce development is a critical issue for us. It's a significant issue in the timber industry. For those of you that flew in to catch a can today or earlier, you may have seen that we are getting a brand new airport paving project. We're completely reconfiguring our airport. It's a really good thing if you've lived in Ketchikan. I was born and raised here, so um, it is a really good thing. However, what it's meant in our industry is we are also actively, one of our member organizations is actively harvesting over on Gravina, the island that the airport is on. We have been really challenged to retain personnel. The job that's here in Ketchikan is a Davis-Bacon job. If you're familiar with wages for jobs, Davis-Bacon is a very high paying wage. Many times small business operators are not able to compete with wage, excuse me, wage ranges that are Davis-Bacon. And the reason I'm sharing this is not to point out that Davis-Bacon is bad. We love seeing those contractors. I shared earlier with someone, I helped put myself through college turning signs along with commercial fishing. So these are critical parts of our rural communities. They're critical parts of the drivers for our economy. However, what if we were thinking broader in our states? Uh, the timber industry tends to bring a lot of contract employees for forestry, also timber harvest from Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Those are states that we see a big influx of our contractors and our workforce. So what if we were thinking more broadly as states around job training initiatives, maintaining banks of employment information for regions or for communities, so that industries, not just ours, but other industries have access to that information? I think how we think more broadly around not just timber but industry would be really helpful to us and perhaps also to other industries in other parts of the states. Um, the big challenge that we face in terms of the why, what do we do, what are we challenged by, the industry in Alaska is unique. As Robert shared, it is not what you may think it was or have heard from very uninformed environmental groups at the national level. There is no large scale harvesting of the Tongass occurring. It hasn't occurred in over 20 plus years. The harvest that occurs in Alaska for timber is akin to small business operators. There really are medium sized operators and very small operators in the Tongass. And as you saw from the slides that Robert also shared, very small percentage of the forest has actively been harvested or is under harvest at this time. Trees literally do jump out of the ground here. Um, they grow on our roofs over the winter if we don't actively do things like pressure wash. So the, for, all the point of that, to get to what Helge said, is the forest here is very unique. The industry is also unique. If you or someone you love is a piano player or plays a wind instrument of any kind or, for example, plays a violin, there's a very high likelihood that that instrument was constructed using old growth harvested timber that was milled by Viking Lumber, the only remaining sawmill in Alaska over on Prince of Wales Island. Old growth timber from the Tongass also provides some of the really highly demanded fine constructed garage doors and solid core doors that are used in construction in the United States. The other piece of our industry is also in an export market, primarily to the Asian parts of the Asian world, Pacific Rim countries, mostly Japan and also China. Young growth products are used there to provide footings for large scale construction. And we know that that is going at an intense pace in places like China. And then also to do interior construction in some homes. The challenge for us is if the industry cannot have a dependable, predictable supply, it's very challenging to enter into long term relationships with customers, either in the US or in other countries. And there have also been challenges of late. Tariffs present challenges to that. Transitions in the federal administration present challenges to that. In Alaska, as you have also seen in some of the other Western states, we are working on a transition to a young growth market. I try to differentiate between old growth and young growth in this way. Um, I heard it best from one of my members, Mr. Kirk Dahlstrom, who owns Viking. An old growth tree is a tree that hasn't been cut before. A young growth tree is a tree that comes up after a tree has been cut down. They're two distinctly different parts of our forest, but management 
harvest of these different components of our forests from our association's perspective is really critical to long-term success. And success for us isn't just our members operating. Success in Alaska that includes timber harvest is about having access to low-cost power, access to transportation, access to decrease in energy cost. It's also about access for other services, for recreation. I love what Justy said earlier when she was talking about the fact that the forest provides us with jobs, access, and also a protection component. And I think that's what often gets left out of the story in Alaska around our forest, be it the Tongass or the Chugach, either one of them. The timber industry in Alaska and the other professionals I've had the pleasure to meet in my time with AFA are some of the most devoted individuals along with their membership to ensuring conservation. I'm real careful not to make that word preservation, please understand that. Conservation of forests because the conservation and protection and sustainability of our forests is what is going to allow us to continually harvest over the long term. And that's another part of the story that, that we would hope would be told more intentionally in the national media. Um, roadless has been a challenge for a number of reasons. Most importantly, you all who are from Western states understand that what it means if we have directives coming from Washington, D.C. that are played out through agency bureaucratic process over decades, folks in rural communities, individuals in other states are left to try to hold all of the pieces together, exorbitant amount of agency resources, community resources, association resources, legal resources are invested on many of these conversations. And unfortunately, I think the challenge is always how can you work through the discussions, but also what does it mean on the ground where policies are employed? Um, for us in Alaska, depending on who you speak to, certainly for the association, the roadless exemption that's under consideration is about access, but it's a conversation that's been occurring for almost 30 years now. So what's the history of the conversation? How do we bring that to bear in moving forward and in solutions? Um, there are other policy issues also that we face. I think one of the realities for all Western states is having a conversation around workforce development, industry, economic development, diversification, what initiatives at the federal level versus regional level of agencies and states mean, and thinking about where there's opportunity for people to share some ideas about what's worked well. And there are a lot of those ideas in Alaska that cross over a variety of administrations. So I think there's solutions that aren't just always entrenched in politics, which is good news. Um, I would just finish by sharing, if I can, that some of the most success that we have had as a member association of late is thinking more broadly around where collaboration opportunity is. So how do we work with entities that perhaps we haven't necessarily engaged with in the past to have conversations about ensuring that we have predictable supply? Because at the end of the day, what we want is to continue to remain living in our communities. Um, I appreciate the story that Justy shared. If any of you are familiar with Ken Kesey's work, perhaps you know of the book, Sometimes a Great Notion. It is a fantastic story about a logging family from Oregon. My dad read that book, and then he said to my mom, let's go to Alaska. It seems like an amazing place. He proceeded to get in a canoe and kayak here from Seattle. Folks here have history in the industry However, the industry is also in transition. And understanding that transition, learning to work with new organizations and think about our opportunity for supply differently is gonna be really important for us as we move forward. So thanks, Laura, for the opportunity. Thanks for WGA for hosting the panel. Thanks so much. Wow, we're hearing so many incredible thoughts today. Um, I'm gonna ask a few questions just to get us talking about some of what we've been hearing. And I think um, we'll do that a bit and then we'll open it to some questions from out there. Um, first, I'm interested to hear a little bit more. You guys have talked a lot about you know, the heavy presence that is um, the federal presence here in Alaska, um, in Southeast Alaska, but also the opportunities associated with um, some of the other ownerships. Uh, we heard about some of the non-traditional ownership models, um, some of the state opportunities. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to 
what are the things that you would need in order to, or would need to be in place for there to be greater harvesting in some of the non-federal areas? So uh, I can start out. I think there's a couple of things that come to mind right away. The, the first one is the obvious, the, the modest land base compared to the, the federal government. Um, there are a few things we could do there. The, there is state land that are available to be recruited into a, a forest management status. I think the, um, by far the, the major limitations for timber harvesting on, on certainly state lands and probably also private lands is public perception, and as uh, people like to call it, social license and um, making people recognize that uh, managed working forests are, are a good thing. We, uh, we all would like to live in nice 4,000 square, square foot homes built out of wood, and there's a lot of us. So uh, that wood has to come from somewhere. We need to support our consumption of wood products uh, it happens every year with new housing starts. And uh, we cannot pretend that this demand does not occur. And uh, if we don't produce the timber and lumber to build these houses, the Canadians will. If they don't do it, the Russians will. Point being that um, that wood has to be produced somewhere, and it will be produced somewhere. And uh, rather than incurring the uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions with transporting wood from uh, other nations, uh, Quebec or even further, it is better to <coughs> produce our wood products domestically. And getting that message out and, and uh, getting that public acceptance of managed forests, I, I think it's important. and. Um, I'm actually seeing some encouraging signs where um, in, in the West, in the lower 48, people are basically tired of wildfire. And um, I, I saw a bumper sticker from, I think, the Oregon Farm Bureau that said, forests, log them or watch them burn. It's, it's really uh, capturing the essence of it right there. And, and somebody talked about electric vehicles. Everybody loves them but they don't support mining. So I think in forestry, we are actually starting to round the corner and the pendulum is swinging back towards public acceptance of forest management. And uh, when you add bark beetle epidemics, tree mortality to uh, the wildfire threat, people see that when they drive down the road and they see a lot of dead trees, red needles, and they, re they realize that something is wrong. So. I do think we are um, actually making some progress on public acceptance of working for us. And um, we just need to get the message out there that <clears throat> these are managed for the public good and uh, they're sustainably managed. If we don't harvest more than what grows back every year, uh, these forests can continue to produce wood for us basically forever. The, uh, I think the last limitation that I, that I would like to mention is really our management style on, s on state lands where we have grown accustomed to being rather conser conserv conservative and um, that makes a difference in how much wood comes off these lands. Um, we could assume that every tree has to grow for 100 years before it's harvestable or we could <coughs> plan for 60 years before trees become harvested, in which case we will produce a lot more wood, basic mat. And 60-year-old uh, forests are eminently sustainable, and um, I think that's, that's one thing we can do to, to improve our, our wood supply from, from state and private forests. Thanks, other thoughts? Sure. I just add that um, I mentioned the uh, Southeast Alaska uh, land exchange that we just completed with the U.S. Forest Service. 
Um, you know, the writing was on the wall 16 years ago when we started the exchange, or at least discussing the exchange. And that was, the trust had lands that were these backdrops to these communities in Southeast. And um, there was a lot of public opposition to the trust um, harvesting that timber. So what we did was we exchanged land with, for remote parcels of federal land. Um, and that's proven to be um, an accomplishment. We're generating revenue, we're getting timber sales out, harvest is happening. Um, you know, one of the other limiting factors though with that is access. And I think in Alaska, um, it doesn't matter if we're in Southeast or anywhere, um, access is a major issue. And even through a, you know, act of Congress, we're still working very hard to get these easements access to the timber that we just received from the federal government. All right, thank you. Um, it sounds as though the regulatory environment that you're all operating in can be fairly uncertain. What are some of the things that can be done to address that uncertainty? I guess I'll just beat the dead horse of the land exchange. Um, <laughs> so what we did was we um, we hedged, we sort of created a hedging strategy, and we issued contracts uh, to the operators prior to even receiving the land. And then we broke this massive exchange into phases to keep the industry alive in Southeast Alaska. We had to do that because we knew this two-year land exchange that started 16 years ago took a lot longer than two years. Um, so we sort of hedged our bets. So I think for us as an industry, we recognize, though we do not love, the fact that the federal agency on whom we are most dependent takes a lot of time to do most everything that it does. So I would respond in two ways to your question, Laura. One is there are opportunities that we've had to provide input in an appropriate way that doesn't step outside the bounds of industry's engagement with agencies that our members may contract with. And by that I mean we've suggested recently to the state of Alaska that they consider, for example, doing purchaser layout, which is something they are considering. We also have had conversations with the Forest Service in the past and utilized some of their challenge cost share agreements, which allowed industry to provide adjacent support and be in the woods with members that are, or, I'm sorry, with personnel from the Forest Service. So those kinds of what may seem small can actually be really significant in shaping and providing information about industry to the agencies. And also just being innovative around the contracting models that are used and making folks aware of what the authorities are to offer different types of contracts or to do different types of work with industry. And the other piece of this that is also um, somewhat confrontational is we are going to be as an industry consistently pushing for things like revision to the existing plan that governs the 2016 plan that governs the Tongass, we're going to be pushing the agencies to be considering revision to also be delivering to the documents that govern what the supply is supposed to be. Um, but there's different elements, right? New creative models, utilizing some of the contracting tools from landowner entities, and also pushing back sometimes on, on what governs legally for us, the supply that comes from the landowners. I think a variant on the hedging strategy is to um, harvest a little less than what grows back every year and basically build a bank account. I, I know I mentioned previously that we should increase our harvest, so I, I want to make po <laughs> point that I, I'm not being inconsistent, but um, keeping a little timber in the bank in reserve is, I think, a pretty good hedging strategy. We, we have, as Tessa knows, um, extra volume on the state forest and that comes in handy when there is a, a rainy day like this. So um, I, I think that hedging strategy works real well given that you, you don't know what the future will hold and um, 
you know, trees take a lot of time to grow. Uh, unlike agricultural crops, a tree is not ready to harvest until 60 years after planted. And that's a lot of time. And um, so I would say um, not making a lot of sudden moves because of that long time horizon is probably a winning strategy. Increased cooperation between the state entities. There is a few others. There is the Department of Natural Resources, Division of Forestry. There is uh, Mental Health Trust, Mining Lands and Water. There is uh, native corporations, essentially private lands. We, uh, I know we can do a more effective job of coordinating and rolling out a sustainable predictable timber supply for, for industry in the southeast. You know, and at the same time, those immortal words, never give up, right? I mean, the Forest Service did try to do the POW, the landscape, uh, you know, long, more long-term planning, was litigated, the courts overturned it, but we can't give up. We've got to keep trying to push that model so we can have some certainty. And I think in the midst of all of that, also advocate for more localized, regional, uh, decision making and control so that um, you know we get something pushed through we get that certainty but um, if it wasn't for the state the industry would be um, I don't know what's two rungs lower than the dire situation it would be in but um, it certainly has been uh, difficult but not for lack of trying but we just can't give up Laura can I add yeah. One other item that I would add as part of a solution, um, and I realized that I hadn't said it when I looked out and saw Kyle Mosell in the audience, is in Alaska, within the Department of Natural Resources, we are also fortunate enough to have a group that has convened all of the landowners. The landowners are having, convert and this includes both the Forest Service, the state entities that are here, the University of Alaska, which in Alaska is a land grant university, along with tribal organizations such as Sea Alaska and others who are interested. So having an overarching conversation that includes developing things like what is the five-year supply look across all of those landowners? What are key issues that are coming up? What is, many of you may have heard that there's been recent announcement by Sea Alaska that they'll no longer be engaged in logging. So they have control of some log transfer facilities, LTFs. These are the land-based component where logs are dumped into the water, placed on barges. This is critical for harvest. They're critical for if you are buying supply or you're buying a timber sale and you're gonna need access to an LTF, you need to know if someone is planning to close that or if ownership is transferring. So these larger groups can have conversations at a state level that really we as an individual association wouldn't be able to have and to do so in a manner that, that addresses the broader issues, some short-term, long-term strategic planning and also very specific issues that are of concern to the industry as they, as they come up. I mean, another, another consideration for us that is also related to the Department of Natural Resources is any of our timber that our operators have that goes over into the Asian markets, we have to have someone from the department that comes and samples those logs to ensure that they don't have any um, s species in them or have any conditions that would not be allowed into, the f into foreign countries. So that involves relationship and those kinds of discussions can be occurring at broader levels with the landowners group that we otherwise would not be able to facilitate ourselves. And so that kind of activity that's led by, in this case, a state entity is very helpful for our membership and for other owners. Just adding a couple of things. I, I think for, well, I, I know for most all of the Western states, this is not unique to Alaska. Um, the federal government is a major landowner, uh, usually the major landowner. And the fact that um, state, private, uh, local lands, together make up somewhere between 10 and 12, 15% is probably not all that unique. So um, I think all the strategies we heard to date is, is probably something that most states have to adapt to and, uh, and make use of. And um, I, I don't think there's anything, anything new here. Um, federal timber harvest has consistently decreased across the West. I, I think it's a sign of the times. Uh, our local colleagues 
the Forest Service is uh, is doing an excellent job with the tools they're given, but they have direction from Washington. I, I think in addition to regulatory environment, I think in a broader sense, we need to adapt to a, a changing political environment. Anything could happen at any time. And uh, the Chinese tariffs on spruce log exports is, is an excellent example. Um, retaliation against American tariffs on their products, it could happen at any time. And um, <coughs> rumor has it that uh, President Vladimir Putin starting January 1, 2022, will prohibit the export of Russian logs in order to encourage Russian domestic production. The export market for Russian logs historically has been China. So what does that mean in a global context? Um, nobody really knows. but. Uh, we need to be prepared for these constantly shifting winds in the timber industry. It's, it's always been that way, and I expect it will continue. Thank you all. Um, a common thread I'm hearing is how much the interdependence across different agencies and players across the state is crucial to supporting a timber industry that's um, got continued supply that is uh, a steady, um, creates a steady marketplace. A question for you, you've mentioned a few different tools, uh, challenge cost share, I heard Tessa mention, good neighbor authority uh, projects. Um, what are other examples of tools you're making use of to enhance cooperation across agencies, with the Forest Service, with each other? Um, across different players in the state? Uh, recently, we started utilizing a harvest market strategy with our contractors. Um, this is um, where we sort of share in the risk and the shared profit is sort of the scenario that this poses. Um, Prior to um, the harvest market strategy, we were just uh, issuing contracts based on stumpage, and the price would be locked in at the time of the contract. Well, for 10 years, um, that contractor would be harvesting timber from trust land um, based on that. And we were seeing, once the uh, Chinese tariffs came on board, that our contractors were coming back to us and saying, like, look, we need out of this. We'll pay, you know, whatever we need to pay to get out of it because this just isn't going to work. Um, so now we're sort of sharing in that risk, we're sharing in that cost, um, and they're able to sell the timber where the market is heightened. And so we both get, you know, a significant amount of revenue, which serves both of our purposes. One of the activities that has occurred for our membership with the Forest Service, in addition to what Justy is referencing from the trust, is NEPA processes are very long. And one of the challenges that we often faced as an industry is our input with regard to what is occurring in domestic and foreign markets and its relationship to what is appealing as a sale for any variety of reasons for an operator may look very different, honestly, from one quarter to the next. And if you've been watching the price of lumber domestically, within weeks it can be very, very different. So what we've been trying to do is engaging early in conversations to the extent that we can with our Forest Service colleagues here in the region and also on the Tongass, for example, about what is actively occurring in markets so that there's an understanding around why sales that they are working towards or, or why projects that they are looking to go through the NEPA process on and place on the shelf for readiness to sell how the industry will look at any spe specific sale, and also because Forest Service sales have now become much smaller than they were some time ago, so that there's an understanding of this sale would be more appealing and available to operators, which really means that they aren't doing pro bono work, okay? Folks in the timber industry can't buy pro bono sales. They have to be able to generate profit. 
on the sales that they purchase. And often those sales from a distinct landowner may be more attractive if they're within adjacency of another landowner's sale or can be combined in some way. And so having a conversation about that earlier on in the sale schedule process so that by the time a sale is ready to emerge, there's a clear understanding about the industry this still is a really big challenge for us though because often the shifting that is occurring so rapidly within the markets makes it really challenging for us to have informed and then four years later for sales to come out. But having the conversation and being engaged actively with the agencies on what is occurring in our markets has been very important. Coordinating with um Federal sale, sales, I, I think, is crucial. W whatever comes out of the federal planning effort in the near term and the long term, we need to be ready for that. And um, using their data that they like to make available, um, if we can coordinate our sales with nearby sales across the legal boundary on federal lands, we can achieve a lot more. It's uh, a bit of a challenge because uh, everything is in flux, as you know, but uh, I think it's a necessary step. Uh, another necessary step is to, in my mind, is to engage with federal planning processes. Right now, the Southeast Alaska Sustainability Strategy is moving forward. It's the um, Forest Service effort to um, reinvigorate local communities in uh, the absence of old growth harvest. And um, it's tempting for the state and, and others to, to not engage, so to speak. But uh, if you're not there, you can't influence the outcome. And um, the, the Forest Service listens and uh, they're, they're willing to consider input. And so whether it comes to fruition or not, I think we need to be at the table. You know, I know we're getting to the end, the end of the session, but you know, on that that note, a kind of a segue. Uh, you know, another uh, issue I think we really have to, uh, to really have on our, our radar is the whole communication strategy, uh, because being at the table for these initiatives, we have to be able to talk a language that resonates, that people understand, and I think that um, you know, one thing that's unique about the, the timber industry here in Southeast. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. We don't have these big multinational conglomerations, uh, corporations. We've got third generation, uh, you know, kids climbing in the cab. Uh, these are family owned. These are uh, local mom and pop businesses that are struggling to, to, to survive. So I think, you know, being able to tell the story, you know, of what truly is happening and the fact that very environmentally conscious. Um, you know, this is a, an environment which we love and cherish and want to protect. It's a renewable resource that we want to sustain, uh, and it's fully utilized. And so I think, you know, we have to have, you know, an integrated timber management, forest management, uh, you know, paradigm that has a mixture of, of older trees, younger trees, but then also generates a waste stream because we're not even getting into that today, but there's a whole industry, you know, being built here in Southeast on a waste stream from the timber industry that is lowering the cost of energy to Alaskans. But, you know, it's all, it's, it's, it's a, all part of a full utilization strategy that I think tells a story that would kind of help change public sentiment and public policy if, um, you know, if we kind of recharacterize uh, the, the, you know, the way we communicate that. So I just kind of want to put that out there. Yeah, really great point. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I do recall that the, the survey from the WGA that was distributed before this meeting, one of the uh, comments were that the most common reason for problems with good neighbor authority and stewardship contracting authority is a lack of federal funding for projects. And um, this is obviously true, uh, funding for all treatments are limited, is, tr is limited, but I, I think a general point is there is there's not enough money in the economy for the government to pay for projects, whether they be thinning or uh, bark beetle mitigation. I think we need to stop looking at what we do as treatments that need government funding 
and start treating them as business ventures that have to pencil out. And um, part of that is allowing for harvesting enough medium and large size trees. You don't have to harvest them all, but if you allow the logger to harvest enough uh, commercial sized trees to make a profit and earn a living wage, pay the mortgage, send the kids to college, then you're onto something. Then you have a self-sufficient um, machine that will keep generating new projects out of the profits of the previous project. So I think that that kind of a solution is, is really missing from the debate where forestry um, can produce a commodity that can make the treatments, uh, whatever they are, restoration or otherwise, um, economically viable and we don't need to ask for government funding. Thank you. I think we have about six minutes left and I do know we wanted to open the floor to questions. We probably have time for one. So if there's a question out there, uh, maybe start in the room or I'll turn it to my WGA colleague there. Yeah, we have a uh, online question from Ann Walker who asks, uh, Alaska has suffered from wildfires as in other states. Does the power generation industry or mining sector collaborate with the state or federal agencies to provide coordinated protection to communities or recovery assistance? I think we do have a uh, pretty successful um, system currently for cooperation between state federal agencies and um, Fires, as we all know, don't respect ownership boundaries, so we, we have to put them out where they occur. Um, I do think we have a pretty good record of cooperating with, with all entities. All right, actually, I guess we have time for one more question. All right, if there aren't any, I'll throw one out there. Um, we heard earlier about workforce issues in the earlier panel, and um, Tessa, you noted some of the challenges associated with workforce. And I'm interested in if there are any successful timber development programs that you all are working on or that you're aware of in the state. Um, and we can go beyond just strictly timber workforce. Are there cross-training opportunities that are coming up to fill specific needs in the timber industry in the state. I'm going to answer that by asking another question and then talking about what you asked. Um, who do you know that is about 18 years old that's going to college right now that's planning to be a forester? Not many folks. Who do you know right now that's planning to not go to college and make six plus figures working on a heavy piece of machinery in a mining location around Southeast Alaska? Maybe some, but not many. We need to tell a different story about what workforce needs are in our Western states, that these are highly paid jobs that need skilled professionals, some of whom may go the college route and some of whom may not. There's really good work that the governor is leading through the Department of Labor to have conversations around development for workforce in Alaska broadly. But I think that there is more that we need as an industry. The reality is most of the members that AFA represents are in their late 50s or 60s. I'm not sharing something that they wouldn't want me to tell you. Um, so the challenge is twofold. Who's going to work for these organizations and who's going to own these organizations? Because right now also an industry like timber is not one where the banking environment is looking to take on high risk businesses. It's high risk when you work in the timber environment. So it's both sides of this. How do we have professionals who come in and want to work in our industry? How do we have local folks who want to be in Alaska, who love being in Alaska? Um, I have two boys. I want them to live in Southeast Alaska and work here if they wish to. And I think part of the challenge for us is thinking about economic development strategies like the ones that are being led by Southeast Conference and other entities around our state in other Western states for the whole picture. 
Who do you need five years out, 10 years out? How are we working actively in schools to develop construction trade curriculums? That's something that we do in Alaska actively. How are we then ensuring that folks can come back from colleges and work be trained in um, jobs. We have an excellent training facility up in Seward here in Alaska that trains in a variety of voc tech educational careers. We need more people to come to work for us in a variety of trades, and they're not out there right now. And traditionally, what we've been doing is importing them from other states, and we'd prefer not to. We actively are looking to hire a forester, for example, at AFA to do work in our world, and it's really challenging to find someone who is interested in doing that who isn't ready to retire. So th we've talked broadly, and I know you all have had conversations about what the graying of the workforce means in federal agencies and the state environment. It's also an issue in industry as well that we need to be talking about more broadly. So I don't know if that's a solution. I know we're talking about it actively in our state, but I think we need to have more conversation that's industry specific and also specific to what makes sense now. We are sending a ton of kids to college. A lot of those kids come out of college without a job and a lot of student loan debt. And I think we need to be talking more broadly as industry around what makes sense for folks leaving environments like high school and going into trades that are highly paid, highly resourced, and that we need in our state very actively, and that we need in Western states, period. Thanks so much. I think we're about at time, so I'll close us out here, but just with a huge thank you to each of you. It's been fascinating.